We've been asked several times why we do things in a certain way, for example, use vex over vops. And in order to show you the different ways how you can attack a given problem, I'd like to build a small scatter tool, which allows me to scatter dirt or snow particles on a given geometry. So let's start out by going in Houdini and dropping down a file node. And what I did from the amazing site 3dscans.com, I just downloaded this little guy here called Puck. I really like this statue of him. What I did was in Houdini, I just dropped down a remesh node on him and saved him out again. So I have a bit of smaller file and that's what I'm gonna load up here. And there he is. What I wanna do, what I wanna achieve, and the question came from Cornelius Demrich, is I want to scatter debris or particles just on one side of the mesh. So just for example, just on the faces pointing upwards, I want to scatter particles on. So there are several ways uh, which I could do that. And as with every problem in Houdini, there are several ways of handling stuff. The first and most straightforward way of handling stuff is using the standard SOPs, if a standard SOP exists for that task. I could just drop down the scatter SOP and wire that up. And that would scatter points uniformly on that little statue there. Let's increase the point count a bit. And maybe lower the relax iterations. So we have something like this. What I need to do in order to scatter only on the parts pointing upwards, I need to select those faces. And in Houdini, the most straightforward way of doing that is with the group node. And I didn't know that until recently. Um, it was just at the Übertage meeting where the guys pointed out that this is one easy solution for this thing. So let's just drop that down in here, highlight it, and let's select the primitives by the direction of the normal. Enable that and um, let's give it a direction pointing upwards. And let's decrease the spread angle. So we can see we select now only faces pointing upwards on this little statue. So when I wire that into the scatter here, I can tell it to only regard the faces that are in this group I just created, like that. And finally, when I merge this with the original geo, I have my particles scattered on that little statue here. This is the way I would recommend for solving most problems in production. If there is a SOP in Houdini, just use that. Usually they are computationally okay. They are not that slow and they're just straightforward to use. However, if you're not sure if that node exists or if you know that there is no node existing for your problem, then what you can do is use either VOPS or VEX to tackle that problem. So let's do that first in VEX with a primitive wrangle and drop that in here. I wanna do the same thing that I did with the groups up here. I wanna select faces pointing in a given direction. First thing I have to do is specify that given direction with a vector. And this is the same thing as I did here with just specifying the up vector. Next thing is I need to get the normal and that way. So just reading out the normal of the primitive of each primitive. Now for the bit more difficult part, I need to calculate the angle between those two vectors. And the way that is done is with this formula. I want to take the dot product of my normalized up vector and my normalized normal. In reality, as both vectors should have a length of one, I could spare myself those normalize um, commands here. I just want to make sure that as soon as I feed in any vectors that are not normalized by default, the formula still works. That dot product, I'll have to feed that into an R cosine like this. And that should yield an error message because I omitted a space here, and that should yield the angle between those two vectors. However, this angle is still in radians, so let's convert it to degrees, and I'm gonna do that by dividing the angle by pi, so that's 3.4 divided by 180. And all I have to do now is decide if this value is below a certain threshold and then put it into a group. So let's first 
define that group. In VEX, what I can do is just drop down a float attrib. So let's call this group underscore group one. And Houdini will automatically recognize that this attribute is responsible for the grouping. So let's set it to zero first. Okay, now let us check if our angle is smaller than a given threshold and I want to be able to adjust that threshold with a slider. So I'm just going to create it with a channel command and let's call it threshold. And if this angle is smaller than the threshold, let's put it in the group. So set that float value to one. Okay, now we tell Houdini to create a slider for this channel value here by clicking on that symbol created slider and let's just adjust its user interface. So it goes from zero to 180 degrees. Let's apply that and hit accept. Let's set it to say 30. Let me check in the geometry spreadsheet. Okay, doc, that seems to work. And now what I can do is again, just take the scatter, copy it over here and check if it's also scattering on the up part and it's exactly doing that. Okay, so this would be the second solution for that problem. Of course, this formula here looks a bit scary at first, but for most problems in 3D, if you don't know the math, it's rather easy to find solutions for that online. So there are a bunch of very helpful resources out there. One of them, of course, being Stack Overflow, Force, and of course, the side effects forums. And yes, you have to know this bit of math or you have to know where to find this bit of math. But what VEX allows you is to create a solution for a problem that you're not able to tackle with standard subs. And as VEX is multi-threaded, it's really fast to execute kind of your universal Swiss army knife if you can't find another quicker solution for things. I'm aware, however, that some of you work in nodes rather than code or prefer to work in nodes. So let's build that in VOPs as well. And let's drop down a primitive VOP here, wire that up to our file as well. And let's dive into the VOP and build the same setup we just did in VEX. So I need a bit of space here. So what we're going to do first is create an up vector, so a constant. And let's set it to be a vector. And let's set it to point into this direction. Now, just for the sake of working uh, cleanly, we'll normalize this vector. And we just copy that and normalize the incoming normal again as well, just to make sure that they have a length of one both. Next thing is I need to calculate the dot product of both. So feed those into that node here. And the result of that dot product, I will feed into an arc cosine and that hides under the trigonometric functions node. I'm going to set it to arc cosine and wire that up to go into the radians input. And now what I need to do is convert the output, which is going to be in radians into degrees. I'm going to do that with the radians to degrees node wired up here. And now I have the angle between the vector n and my up vector. What I want to do now is check if that angle is beneath a certain threshold. So I'm going to drop down a compare node, wire my angle in here, and say, test if the angle is less than input two. And with a middle click on input two, I'm going to promote that parameter up one level so I can just adjust it with a slider again. Okay, what this node does is if this input here is smaller than what's coming in here, it will output a Boolean true. So that's a one. Otherwise, it will output a Boolean false, which is going to be a zero. And I can use that to drive a switch node, just wired up to the switch input. So if this is not true, then the first input is selected. And if this is true, the second input is selected. So let's provide values for both inputs and both are going to be a constant one is set to zero. And the other is going to be set to one. Wire them up zero here, one here. And finally, what we're going to do is with a bind export, write out this value to a float parameter. And just like previously, we call it group underscore group one. So we wire that up here. And that should be it. So outside of it, let's check, set this one to 30 and maybe 
the parameter interface set its range to 0 to 180 and wire up a scatter as well and see if it works. So yeah, same result here as here. Okay, it's maybe time to save this and let's talk a bit about why I prefer VEX over VOPS. So this is like eight lines of code and code to me, although I never had a developer background, um, I had some semesters of programming. I always did a bit of script kidding around here and there. That is rather straightforward for me to read. However, when I dive into this primitive VOP, and this is a straightforward note tree, don't get me wrong. However, for most math stuff, to me, it just is easier to read text than um, this bunch of notes in a note tree. So I rather stick to um, writing VEX directly than clicking it together in the primitive VOP. However, when you right click on the primitive VOP or on any VOP, you can go to VEX VOP options and view the VEX code it generates. So by clicking together these nodes, what you actually did was internally create VEX code. So when you drag that down, you see there's quite a bit of VEX. That is because this node has many default options. It just brings with it. This is the stuff that's in here in addition to just the simple nodes that you click together now. So it's pretty verbose in contrast to what you um, just wrote in the primitive wrangle here. So when you compare this, this is like, I don't know, more than 100 lines compared to these eight lines here. That is quite a difference in readability in my opinion. So yes, you can use the primitive VOP. Yes, it's going to give you VEX. However, I prefer the handwritten VEX. I just like reading code. So now that we can scatter our points onto faces facing in one direction, let's build on this a bit further. And for example, scatter only in creases where our mesh has concave curvature here. So where it's actually like pointing inwards and not on the very exposed parts of it. The most robust way I found to do this is with a VDB analysis. So let's first convert our mesh into a VDB. So VDB from polygons, wire this up, highlight it, and maybe dial down the voxel size a bit, or maybe a bit too small, something like that. And wire up a VDB analysis node. And in here we can tell the VDB analysis to calculate the curvature. And the curvature is a value that tells me in which direction the curvature goes, so if it's concave or convex, and how strong it's curved. So let's project that back onto the mesh with an attribute from volume node, wire up the original mesh in here, and the curvature shader in here, and you can see it's by default set up to map this incoming attribute here to the color of the mesh, which is okay for us now. Let's just go under the mapping tab, and change the input range from say minus 10 to 10. This is a good ballpark number for your curvature values. Let's check map volume to value so we can adjust the mapping here with this nice curve. What we want is to actually have higher values in the creases here. Let's just go to presets and um, just invert this curve so it gets white or brighter in the creases, darker on the exposed parts. Let's drag in those a bit to increase the contrast. Okay, let's pull it up again. And now what we're going to do is just copy those two nodes here, attach them down here, and let's first highlight the group node. And we see we selected those faces pointing upward. Let's increase it a bit like so. And on those selected faces, we want to use the brightness to drive how much points are scattered in there. We do that by going on the scatter sop, highlighting it, and unchecking force total count and checking density attribute instead and define the color as density attribute and then we're just gonna increase the density scale a bit. So what we're doing now is on those faces pointing upwards, we are using the color information on those faces to define how many points are scattered in there. So now we're scattering mainly in those concave areas. So let's merge those two again, the original geo, and the scattered points by um, using the attrib from volume to drive the color. We just messed up the color a bit and we're going to fix that by attaching another color sub beneath and highlighting it. So what we have now is a scatter tool that you can drive on the one hand by a directional vector, on the other hand 
drive by the curvature of your object. And it's just a small tool, but it can be turned into a digital asset and still form a versatile tool in your tool bag. So I hope you had fun with it. Hope we shed some light on the different approaches of solving a given problem in Houdini. We're looking forward to seeing your artwork and it's cheers and goodbye.